mute themselves for the du duration of the lecture. We encourage you all to ask questions during the lectures, but please do so in the chat. One of the organizers will communicate your questions to the instructor. You will also have an opportunity to ask questions verbally at the end of each lecture. That being said, we are very excited to have Joshua Frisch speaking on bounded harmonic functions on groups. Whenever you're ready, Josh. Hi, thank you all so much for having me. So um, again, just a note before we start, please, please ask me questions. It, it's so much more fun and so much easier if I'm getting sort of feedback on what's coming through as uh, I'm talking. So I figured I would start with a little motivation um, and starting in particular with a not actually mathematical quote. Groups as people will be known by their actions. Um, and, and the idea here is that if you're given some group, right, the right way to understand it is not as some abstract object handed from on high, but find a natural thing which it acts on and use those actions to determine things about the groups. And harmonic functions, they have a lot of um, good value. I actually came into them more interested from the probabilistic side, but they're a really good function space on which groups can act. They have a lot of nice properties. They're sort of comprehensible. They're not too big. So you can get interesting representations. You can get interesting properties by looking at the sort of very natural action, which we'll define in a little bit of a group on a harmonic function. And the general philosophy we're gonna be playing within this thing is how do properties of the group and properties of the harmonic functions on that group interplay? How can you take what's going on on one side and sort of move it to the other side? Um, and there are things in both directions. Um, in the next slide, I'll cover a bunch of um, really fascinating applications of you know, harmonic function techniques to pure group theory. Unfortunately, then I'll proceed to um, ignore them for the rest of the lecture because they're sort of beyond the scope. But um, I do want to be clear, this is not just sort of an idle pursuit. And again, the ideas really do go bo in both directions here. Um, if you want to understand the harmonic functions, you're going to get into all sorts of interesting algebraic properties of the group. We're going to bring up the ICC property, virtual nil potence, polynomial growth, amenability, um, in some of the exercises, I think we're going to bring up groups of, you know, sub exponential growth, um, sort of various things like recurrence and transients are going to show up all sorts of um, sort of group theoretic properties are often naturally encoded or naturally interpretable by looking at the space of harmonic functions. And similarly, the harmonic functions tell you something about what you can do on the group. So. I'm going to give three applications right now. As mentioned, unfortunately, all of them are sort of beyond the scope of this class, but hopefully they will convince you that, yes, this really is something you might want to study, even if for some reason you decided you hated function spaces or for some reason you didn't care at all about harmonicity. So first of all, you can use harmonic functions to um, prove Gromov's theorem. Right, so Gromov's theorem for people who don't know says that every group of uh, polynomial growth is virtually nilpotent. It's sort of one of the big first structural theorems um, and historically one of the first in geometric group theory. Um, if you see the proof of Gromov's theorem, there are several proofs to, right now. And for all of them, it's not that any of the steps are easy per se, but the hardest step is always finding a representation of your group in sort of a finite dimensional linear space or a finite dimensional Lie group. And it turns out, and this is due to Kleiner, that if you look at the space of harmonic functions of linear growth, or more generally polynomial growth, this is gonna give you a finite dimensional vector space. And so that's gonna let you sort of following the rest of the standard parts of the argument actually prove Gromov's theorem. Another example, um, sort of there are two proofs of this fact, but one directly is going to use the Poisson boundary and one uses um, random walks, which are very related. So a long 
generally very hard question in group theory is what types of groups can you get? What properties can you sort of smash together? together? And um, I'll bring up what amenability actually means tomorrow. So at that point, if you haven't seen amenability, you'll be able to actually understand what the statement is saying. But amenability is a very classical, very important geometric property of a group. And for the longest time, all finitely generated amenable simple groups um, that were known were finite. You can find fin all finite groups are amenable so, and there are finite simple groups, but there was not a single um, infinite known example. Um, close to 10 years now ago now, that changed. People found examples and interestingly, in order to construct things, in order to prove amenability, they used random walk techniques. And there's a very um, interesting paper by uh, Nicola Madaban, where actually he does something better. He proves something about that the space of har bounded harmonic functions on some group is trivial. And from that, he's able to deduce amenability. The simplicity all sort of follows from a uh, little bit uh, different vein, but um, something that is somehow also considered the easier direction. Um, the, of course, it's still not easy. And so you can get these examples of groups, which really nobody had any idea how to construct before using harmonic functions. And the third application I want to talk about is Grigor Chuck's group is the first example of um, a group of sub-exponential growth, which is not polynomial growth. Um, these are really interesting things. For a very long time, it wasn't clear any such object could exist. And um, right, you might want to say, if you have such an interesting group, um, well, can we get um, estimates on how quickly it's growing? It's growing sub-exponentially, but really how quick is it growing? And you can use the Poisson boundary and you can use this har harmonic function stuff in order to actually get essentially sharp, right? Sharp to somehow um, a little low term and, uh, until understanding the second order term growth of the group. So you can understand the main term of growth and the upper bound has been known for a while, but the lower bound, the way to lower bound these things uses harmonic functions on groups. Uh, sorry, there's a question uh, I think about application two, the question is, is, is this the group uh, from Mano and Yushchenko or a new example by Meta Um The Mano no and Yushchenko thing uses random walks. I don't think it uses um, the Psalm boundary quite as explicitly, but it's, it's very related. But the Mata Bon example, which is a follow-up in some ways to that one, just directly uses the Louisville property. And in my opinion, the proof is even, um, is somehow a little bit clearer for amenability there. The, the um, Jenko Mano proof is a little more difficult. So somehow the clearest example comes from random walks and harmonic functions, or sorry, just come from harmonic functions. All right, are there any other questions? And again, the, I'm, I'm sorry, I have three hours and I'm gonna look in a little bit of a different direction. I'm not gonna explain any of these results, but I did wanna make it clear that they are out there, that harmonic functions are something one might study, even if one decided for some reason they don't care about harmonic functions at all. And here's a different form of motivation, sort of coming from the harmonic point, functions point of view. Harmonic functions are definable for R to the N and more generally for sort of any um, Riemannian manifold. People can often take results about these groups and transfer them and get results about these manifolds. And harmonic functions on manifolds are one of the sort of most classical differential equations, I guess maybe a little bit of differential geometry objects one can study. In particular, in R to the end, there's a really beautiful theorem called Louisville's theorem, which says that all bounded harmonic functions are constant for which groups can we generalize it? There's also a theorem also called Louisville's theorem that says all positive harmonic functions are constant for which groups can we generalize that? And then uh, yet another motivation is as we'll soon see, it's sort of random walks and harmonic functions are just incredibly intimately connected to the point where I would argue 
harmonic functions on groups and random walks on groups, they're actually basically the same field. Um, and you can learn a lot about harmonic functions from the random walks point of view, but you can also learn a lot about random walks from the harmonic functions point of view. Uh, tomorrow we'll see that sort of the stuff we do today about non-existence non of harmonic functions has a really strong, really powerful interpretation at sort of the level of random walk. It somehow is going to say there's no interesting asymptotic events. And then finally, there's the last one, which is for me, of course, very motivating, interesting, which is just intrinsic interest. These functions are nice objects and the properties reflect things as a group. Why wouldn't you want to study them? Anything which sort of is telling you coming from a group and telling you so much about the group it's coming from, well, it's something that has to be worth studying. All right, and I wanted to just say the plan for the week. So today I'm gonna to sort of discuss preliminaries. I'm gonna define harmonic functions. I'm gonna define random walks. I'm gonna do a very quick crash course in probability. And then I'm gonna finish by proving the Shokadeni theorem for sort of as many groups as I can get to in time. Tomorrow we're gonna to take the, and the Shokadeni theorem is gonna say that a bunch of harmonic functions are trivial. Tomorrow we're going to discuss the Poisson boundary and then related things like the entropy criterion and the kaimanovich verschik theorem. And then on Thursday, we're gonna loop back and to today and prove the converse to what we proved today. Somehow we're gonna prove one direction of a theorem today and then the other direction is gonna come on Thursday. And this result is very recent. It's from the past few years. Um, and then I'm have, there's a bunch of bonuses we will discuss as time permits. All right. I feel like it's been long enough. I should probably define um, a harmonic function. A function on R to the D is harmonic if the Laplace operator of F is equal to zero. If you're like me, this is too much calculus. So you'd rather have a different way of viewing it. And luckily there is an equivalent condition here, um, which is like the mean value condition. A function f is harmonic if it's equal to its average in a ball around itself, right? So if I have a harmonic function and I want to know what its value is at point x, well, I just take um, a radius 1, radius 2. It doesn't matter which radius ball around x. and takes the average in that ball, and that's going to give me the value of my harmonic function. You could also take the average on the boundary if you so desired. And sort of as I just mentioned, there's a beautiful theorem here, Louisville theorem, which says that every bounded harmonic function is constant and also every positive one. Positive um, will leave for the exercises. Um, a lot of the exercises are gonna be about extending things from the realm of bounded to sort of more general domains. And this is a very nice theorem, a very powerful theorem. I'm gonna talk about a very, um, and I should say most of what I'm gonna be talking about is discrete groups, but this is gonna sort of give a little bit of the flavor of the field. Um, and it's a little bit cleaner to do it for R to the N. So we're doing it. I'm gonna give a proof of Louisville theorem due to Edward Nelson. All right. So here's the idea. It suffices to show that for any X and Y, the absolute value of the difference between X and Y is less than epsilon, right? Or for any X, any Y and any epsilon. All right, let me see if I can find, um, I'm gonna just draw this on the whiteboard very quickly. Can people see the whiteboard? All right. Um, So this is, you know, so our harmonic function is the average of, of um, you know, our harmonic function over this ball. But if instead we look at another ball placed nearby, I'm sorry, these circles are supposed to be the same size, but I am bad at drawing, right? The value at x is going to be the average of the circle around x, and the value at y is going to be the average of the circle around y. But as these circles get really, really large, they become really, really close to each other. 
right? They basically become the same circle. So except for sort of an epsilon proportion of the area, they're the same thing. And as epsilon gets really, really small, this means the value of x and the value of y need to be getting really, really close to each other. And so in particular, f of x and f of y, they can't have any real distance from each other. And so we're done. Every bounded harmonic function um, is constant because we've just taken x and y arbitrarily. So let me go back and share this. Uh, Danelli asks, how, how does this use the bounded assumption? Oh, it's a, it's a good question. Um, well, we have a very small piece on the boundary on sort of which belongs to one circle, but doesn't belong to the other circle. And because of the boundedness, we know this is not going to affects the average very much. However, if you weren't a bounded function, well, maybe the, it's the average on one and the average on the other, but a huge part of the average could hypothetically be on the boundary component or on the thing that belongs to one ball and doesn't belong to the other. So you need sort of the boundedness to go from uh, the fact that the difference in areas is very small to the difference of the values of the functions is very small. All right. Any other questions about the proof? Unfortunately, so, right, unfortunately, this proof really is in many ways an art of the D proof, and it really is in a number of ways um, a continuous proof rather than a discrete proof. Um, you, I mean, you can build analogs that in, in some sense we're going to do that. Um, especially in some of the exercises, but um, they're all a little bit more finicky. So the first thing we want to do is basically we want to kill all the calculus. Um, I want to define harmonic functions for groups. I don't want to have to think about calculus. I am much happier when I'm not doing integrals. So we're not going to generalize this integral definition. That's going to be really awkward or sorry, we're not gonna generalize this sort of differential calculus definition. That would be really awkward to do on a discrete group. Derivatives don't really make sense on discrete spaces. And to the extent that they are, you get weird uh, discrete derivatives, which are not quite as nice. But integrals you can analogize to quite nicely. And everything here can be done in the very interesting, I should say, case of like locally compact groups where you deal with the horror measure. Um, this is fascinating. This was actually Furstenberg's sort of original motivation when he studied this stuff. But it's a, it's a geometric group theory thing and discrete groups are somehow nicer. So we're gonna focus on discrete groups. And also there's a lot of phenomena that show up in the discrete setting that somehow just can't in the continuous setting. Right, so the idea, we have this mean value property for a harmonic function, why don't we just generalize that? There's a few problems though. First of all, there's not a clear analog of balls in a general discrete group. And you might say, well, yeah, there is, right? Just choose some finite generating set and then just take balls in the uh, Cayley graph. But this really depends on the generating set. It's not canonical in the same way that balls in R to the D are canonical. Right, so you have this huge can, um, sort of canonicity problem. But there's a solution, which is to give up. There's, we just say that there's many different notions of harmonic functions for every um, sort of, instead of having the notion of a unique harmonic function, we will have many notions of harmonic functions. And some of the deepest, hardest questions in the field, which are still, for the most part, completely wide open, are about how these different, you know, notions of harmonic functions 
interrelate to each other. All right. So, so here's the general setup. Give it a countable group. And I want to be clear, we're going to do everything over countable groups, not just finitely generated. And this is going to matter even in just a finitely generated situation. Like even if you don't care about infinitely generated groups, they show up when proving things about finitely generated groups. Um, and so, and then we have our countable group G and mu is gonna be, uh, again, not necessarily finitely supported, probability measure supported on G. Well, I want, I'm gonna want my measure to play with my group somehow. So the condition I want here is that I want the support to generate G as a semi-group. So what that means is that I, if I take the support of my measure, if I look at all places where the measure is not equal to zero, that's enough to generate my entire group. Um, if you just generate it as a group, the issue is that, well, essentially you would run into all sorts of difficulties where you'd have the same harmonic function in some sense belonging to different groups. And, it, and it's much more complicated. I should be clear, I won't actually need this assumption for everything I do. There's a lot of theorems I'm going to prove which are actually true even under weaker assumptions or even under no assumptions. But I don't want to focus on that technicality. It's sort of not the key idea of what's going on. Um, and if you really want to learn that, you can look at some of the papers and see exactly which um, assumptions they use in the papers. But really, um, non-degeneracy is not a very strong condition to request. And now I get to talk about the main thing we'll be discussing in this um, course, harmonic functions, right? So a harmonic function is something where um, basically the value of k is the average of the ball around k. Except for ball, we just take any measure. And so we say f of k, well, that's going to be the average of f of kg. What type of average? Well, the average with respect to mu. And I'm saying we're doing this for all measures. Oh, sorry, I, I want to, but there's some nice properties. First of all, just an easy thing. Um, if your mu harmonic, your mu convoluted with itself n times harmonic. In general, the star n notation is going to mean the nth convolutional power of mu. So I take mu and then I can involve it with itself again and again and again n times. Um, and it's pretty easy to see this sort of just directly from the definition. You just rewrite f in terms of mu and then you rewrite these things in the sum again and again and you immediately get it by induction. And some things that's really important, right? Uh, these spaces, it's not just harmonic functions. There's a very natural group action associated with them, right? Where basically if I have a harmonic function f, I can send it and I want to apply g to it. Well, I just send it to f of g of x. And it's essentially immediate that this will also be a harmonic function. And it's immediate if, if the original harmonic function was, you know, bounded, positive, any of these nice properties, the new one will be as well. And again, for a lot of these things, right, for bounded harmonic functions, these are actually going to form a function space. Obviously, you can add them as well. You can scale them by any scalar you want. Um, so I, I did say we're going to do this for all mu, but I'm not actually interested in all mu quite equally much. I am interested in many different mu's, but certain mu's are sort of more interesting. It's very natural, right, in analogy with the ball case, to request that the measure be symmetric, right? That's a very reasonable condition to request. And it's a very natural thing to ask that your measure be finitely supported, right? So maybe just supported on the generators of your group. But even when we're studying questions just about these, we're going to want this sort of broader, more general machinery as well. All right. Sorry, what does symmetric mean? Uh -huh. Sure. Um, measure is symmetric if basically um, I can take 
if mu of g is equal to mu of g inverse for every okay. g and g. All right. Now I'm going to switch gears a tiny bit, and I'm going to talk about random walks on groups. Given a group g and an element a and g, and a measure mu, we can define a random walk starting at a. And you can ignore a for a second. Imagine just set a to the identity when you're thinking about this. This is a little bit of a generalization, which is useful, but really the idea is the same. With the a isn't going to do much here. And right, so what is a random walk? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply on the right. And at each step, I'm going to take a random element of G. Random with respect to what? Well, with respect to mu. I guess I, I believe I called mu a probability measure. I should say all my measures are going to be probability measures unless I do something wrong. I, I'm not ever going to really be thinking about measures with infinite support. So if I happen to not mention that a measure is a probability measure, you can, unless I sort of explicitly state otherwise, assume it's a probability measure. Right, so a random walk, we say that what's the odds of going, you know, from A to G1 and to A G1 and then to A G1 G2 and then and so forth to A G1 G2 G3 dot 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 Gn. Well, the odds you take your first step to G1 is mu of G1. The odds you take your second step, sorry, that's supposed to be a product, not a convolution, um, to G2 is just mu of G2. And so the odds that you do Zs for your first n steps. Well, it's just mu of g1 times mu of g2 all the way times mu of gn. So what's the connection with harmonic functions? Why am I bringing it up right now? Well, this convolution fact I just said, it corresponds to the fact that if you take a harmonic function and you take sort of a random walk with respect to mu, then this isn't going to change the value, right? So if I take n steps of a random walk, the expected value is exactly where I started. And this, so this random walk point of view sort of makes it a little bit more intuitive. You don't have to think out abstract convolutions. You're just saying, I take n steps along my measure, and then the average is exactly what I started with. And again, unless otherwise noted, we can just assume walk start as the identity. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about some basic properties um, of random walks on groups. Um, some of you might have seen this before. If you haven't, don't worry. I'm not going to prove some of this stuff. The exercises, right, the proofs will be on the exercise sheet. And I should just warn, they're not bad. They're going to be sort of fairly straightforward estimates. Um, they're not, they're not going to be the harder exercises I give. Um, so given a group G and a measure mu on G, we say a random walk is transient. Oh, I completely messed it up. Recur I, uh, let me see. I meant to say recurrent here. If with probability one, you return to the identity infinitely often. So you're transient if you don't return to the identity infinitely often. I don't know if I can actually add a little note here but there's a little knot here in this first line. So please remember. So if you return infinitely often, you're recurrent. If you don't return infinitely often, you're transient. So Polya proved a really interesting thing. If I'm in one dimensions or in two dimensions, if I'm on Z or Z squared, and I take the sort of natural random walk. Um, so let me start sharing my whiteboard again. Right. So I take a little random walk on, you know, z or z squared. I'm just trying to draw my steps at random. You should think about this sort of um, the traditional image is you have somebody who is um, extremely sort of intoxicated walking around. And each step, they've forgotten entirely where they go. So they just take a step at random. Um, 
So if you take this random walk on zero z squared, eventually you will return to the origin infinitely often with probability one. On the other hand, and this is going to be a little bit um, harder to draw. If I do this in three or more dimensions, well, I'll go and I'll go and I'll go and I'll go. And at some point, I'll return to the origin. I'll return to any given point for the very last time. So one and two dimensions and three and more dimensions are fundamentally different. And in general, one of these two things is true. Either almost surely you'll only return finally many times or almost surely you'll return infinitely many times. If it's finite, we say it's transient. And if it's infinite, we say it's recurrent. Let me stop share and then. So I, I want to be clear, transients and, recur and recurrence are um, not a property of the group. They're a property of the group in the measure. Um, if I go left one third of the time and right two thirds of the time, by the law of large numbers, I'm just not going to return to uh, zero infinitely often. And this sort of makes sense, right? If you're trying to walk and I'm going in a random direction, but there's a very heavy uh, headwind pushing me to the right, over time, I'm going to go to the right. Um, so I, I'm going to generalize this notion a little bit. And again, all these generalized notions are somehow going to depend on the choice of measure mu too. So given a group G, a measure mu, and a subgroup H, we're going to say that H is a recurrent subgroup if with probability 1, um, a random walk starting at any G and G will eventually hit H. Equivalently, it'll hit H infinitely many times. So basically, a recurrent subgroup is a subgroup that you know eventually you're going to hit. Eventually you're going to go to that subgroup. And again, recurrent subgroups really depend on the choice of measure mu. It's not purely a function um, of G and H. And you can think about this sort of example and see how you might use that to prove the one I just proved shown to prove that example to prove this. But there are some cases where it really doesn't depend on the measure. If H is a finite index subgroup of G, H is always going to be recurrent, right? For any measure which generates, uh, again, we're going to assume sort of non-degeneracy of the measure. Why? Well, I mean, I'm going to leave it a little bit on, as an exercise, but there's only finitely many cosets you'll be walking on. You'll sort of be walking along the cosets. And because there's only finitely many, it's really unlikely you're not going to hit all of them eventually, or all of them infinitely often. All right. Any questions uh, so far? OK, thank you. So I'm going to give a very quick crash course on uh, martingales right now. And you should think of martingale sort of as a generalization of a uh, random walk, they are. Um, and you, the other sort of narrative we say is you have um, somebody who's betting, right? Betting at a fair casino. Um, and so how they bet, it might depend on their previous bets. They can do sort of whatever complicated strategy they want, but they can't look into the future. They can only bet based on what they've seen so far. So um, often martingales are def uh, defined in terms of filtrations and stuff. This adds a little bit of a 
complicatedness and a little bit of sort of technicality I don't want to get into. So some of these definitions might be sort of a little bit um, non-standard or, or definitely some of them are much more specialized than is typical. But a martingale is just some event so that if you want to know what the expectation at time n is, conditioned on everything you've seen in the past. If you want to know how much money you'll have at time n, well, on average, it's how much money you had at time n minus 1. And a martingale is bounded if, well, it's going to stay between c and d um, for all times. Sort of the uh, key example. If you if x n is like a mu g random walk starting at a g, then f of x n is going to be a martingale for any harmonic function. So basically, if I take a random walk with respect to mu, and then I apply a harmonic function f to that random walk, that's going to give me a martingale. That's sort of the key example we're going to think about. Now there's one more sort of technical concept I need to bring up. A stopping time of a martingale is sort of a natural number valued random event tau, such that the event y equals t, right? So, or I guess I should have said uh, tau is equal to t, is independent of xt plus one, xt plus two, and so on and so forth. Um, so what does that mean? Well, we think back to our gambler, right? And our gambler can at any time decide they want to stop. But when they decide they want to stop, that can only depend on what they've seen so far. So they can stop in any way. They can, you know, flip a coin. They can, you know, say, ah, was what I, the amount of money I was making at times three and times five the same? As long as they don't do the obviously illegal thing of looking into the future. I should say xt plus 1, xt plus 2, xt plus 3, and so forth. And there's a sort of very key example of a stopping time, right? Which is that if we take um, a recurrent subgroup, right, and you apply some harmonic function to that, you can wait till you hit that recurrent subgroup, right? So you take your random walk on g, and you want to wait till you hit your recurrent subgroup h. Well, you just stop the first time you see h. And that doesn't require looking into the future at all. So when you apply that to, um, so when you, the stopping time, when you hit H, that's going to give you a martingale for your harmonic function. And there's two results, which I'm going to use here. The first is that bounded martingales converge. If you're bounded martingale and I take sort of a sequence, I'm going to take your value at time one and then at time two and then at time three, and so on and so forth. In the limit, it's going to converge to something with probability one. So you're not going to oscillate infinitely much as time goes on to infinity. And moreover, it's going to converge to some value. At, at the end of time, there's some amount of money you have. And the expectation of what you had is exactly what you had when you started. And then I brought up this notion of stopping time. The key result here is the optional stopping time theorem, which says that if I have a bounded martingale, well, I can stop at that bounded martingale. And it's also going to give me the same expectation. Or sorry, if I stop at that uh, stopping time, if I stop my martingale at that stopping time, it's going to give me the same value as when I started. So basically, I'm, right, I run my random walk. I tell you when I'm going to stop, and then I stop. And the expectation there is exactly as it was when I started. Um, all these things sort of rely on boundedness or some other assumptions. If you don't have boundedness, uh, there are examples where the conclusions are false. Uh, can I ask a question? So uh, I, I, it's not clear to me why you mentioned um, harmonic functions in the last bullet point of the previous slide. Was it, was it um, uh, I mean, Hitting. Well, like, just because technically asking for 
a hitting time for a recurrent subgroup. Mm -hmm. Like that's not, what does it mean for that to be a stopping time? A stopping time has to be defined with respect to a martingale. So that's why you have to apply the harmonic function to your group. It's sort of a technicality, if that makes sense. Okay. To answer the question. All right, so I wanna give two applications of the optional stopping time theorem. First of all, if I have a group G and a probability measure mu and a recurrent subgroup, um, let's say H, there is a probability measure mu h supported on h so that any mu harmonic function is automatically mu h recurrent. Um, and what's the proof of this? Well, you just run your random walk until you've taken some element of h steps. And then uh, by the optional stopping time theorem, you're still going to be harmonic for that new measure. In application two, says if you're a recurrence, if you're zero on a recurrent subgroup, then you're zero everywhere. And again, the idea is well, take the stopping time, which is when you hit that recurrent subgroup H. So I, I take my random walk and I wait till I hit H. Well, at h at zero, so by the optional stopping time theorem, you know the, it's going to be the average according to some complicated measure of zero. But it doesn't matter which measure you average zero over, right? I can choose any weird multipliers of zero I want and add them together, and I'm still going to get zero. So basically, one way to interpret this is that a harmonic function is entirely determined by its values on um, a recurrent subgroup or more generally a recurrent subset. Does a free group have um, any non-finite index subgroup that's recurrent? Um, yes, right? You, so the free group, there's a canonical action to Z squared, right? Just by modding up by common, like, or sorry, let's take F2. There's a canonical action to like Z squared just by modding out by all commutators. And that's a recurrent subgroup because sort of um, you return to zero if and only if sort of the walk on Z squared returns to zero. I see, thank you. So it does depend on the measure. And I think, right, if you don't, um, I, I'm not sure about this, but I, I don't know if there are any examples once you um, allow any measure. I think finite indexings might be the only things that work for all measures. Are there finitely generated subgroups? Um, I would have to think about that. I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, I'd have to think about that. I just don't know right now. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I want to use an application of this thing, right? I just brought up a bunch of heavy machinery and I'm, I'm sorry about that. I, I wouldn't have done it if it wasn't necessary. Um, but let's think about harmonic functions on Z squared now. And I'm gonna just choose the, the sort of easiest measure. I'm gonna go up a quarter of the time, to the left a quarter of the time, to the right a quarter of the time and down a quarter of the time. Then any bounded harmonic function has to be constant. So for this measure, there are no bounded harmonic functions. And I want people to think about why that might be for a second. Um, well, basically, we, we're just going to apply um, the previous um, theorem, the previous thing about a recurrent subgroup. The point is that now, just the value at zero, zero, the value at the identity, that's going to be a recurrent subset. So you're just going to be by the optional stopping time theorem, or I guess equivalently, you could do this by the second corollary um, with a little uh, finesse, right? You 
run your random walk until you hit zero. That's a stopping time. And at that stopping time, well, you're some complicated average of the value at zero, right? So I have some sum of the value of zero plus something else times the value of zero. And they, whatever things I add up, it's some complicated infinite sum of things, but it adds up to one. So I'm one times my value at zero. So no matter where I started, I'm one times my value at zero. So this shows how the sort of abstract stuff can already give us some nice machinery, right? It already shows that there's no bounded harmonic functions um, on Z squared. Unfortunately, this proof is not going to generalize to a Z is a D because as soon as you're beyond Z squared, you stop being recurrent. All right. So I'm, now I'm going to ask sort of the main question I care about in this course. For which groups G and measures mu are all bounded harmonic functions constant? Here's the answer. We don't know. We're still looking. This is a really hard question in full generality, right? So you can say a group and a measure, we call it Louisville. Exactly what's Louisville? Even for, you know, finitely supported symmetric measures, there's a huge number of groups where we just don't understand what's going on. All right, so let's and, and somehow this is, I want to be clear, this is one of the mo main questions which motivates a lot of things I think about. I, I really like this question, trying to figure out what's Louisville and what's not, but we're nowhere close yet to what I would consider a really general answer in some sense. There, there's various things you can say that sort of are technically equivalent, but it's essentially moving from one technical condition to another. All right. Well, there's a lot of choices of measures there. So let's simplify. For which group can we prove that all measures have only bounded harmonic function? Well, you can do this for finite groups, but this is already an interesting question for Z. Is it the case that for all measures on Z, um, a bounded harmonic function is automatically constant? Sorry, I said, I, I missed, type, there was a typo there. It's not have only bounded harmonic functions. It's that only bound, all bounded harmonic functions are constant. I should have included the word constant here. Sorry. And, and I just want to say the original results in this vein were uh, discovered by David Blackwell. And then it's been sort of generalized by many, many people. And I'm going to bring up what I am the last sort of hard technical thing from outside of group theory that I bring up. And I hope I believe I'm not going to bring up any other such thing in this course. Um, so apologies. So, Crown Millman theorem. If I have a compact convex subset of a Hausdorff locally convex topological vector space, it's equal to the closed convex hull of its extreme points. And an extreme point is just a point which can't be written as a convex combination of two other things. So what is this actually saying? Well, it's saying that if we look at um, you know, some space of functions and we want to understand it, all we need to understand is its extreme points. And if it has very few extreme points, there are very few functions in that space. All right, any questions so far? I'm going to just try and squeeze through the proof in the last little bit of time I have. All right. So now we're gonna prove the Schokadeni theorem in its classical setting for abelian groups. Let G be a countable abelian group and mu a non-degenerate measure, then all bounded harmonic functions are constant. This works for Z squared, it works for Z cubed, it works for Z to Z omega, um, and we don't need any assumption on the measure. So this is sort of dramatically more powerful than what we just proved. Um, how are we going to prove this? Well, it suffices to prove that for all bounded harmonic functions, you know, applying G doesn't do anything. 
right? Because then the value of f at you know f of g of, of right at all the different f of g's is going to be constant. So we're going to prove instead this thing that we're going to fix the g and prove that g of f is equal to f. Now, by the non-degenerateness, non I'm going to just choose a nice convolutional power where I have g in my in the support, right? That's what non-degenerateness means, right? It means you can just take a power where uh, you get g. Um, I don't think you technically need it here, but it does make the argument a little cleaner, so I'm going to use it. And I'm going to give this new function this nth convolutional power name new. And now we're going to analyze the new bounded harmonic functions. And we're going to claim these are all fixed by G. Well, it's, well, so let's consider an interesting space here. Let's look at all the bounded harmonic functions, which are bounded between zero and one, um, endpoints allowed. So they might take a value and might have zero as a value, they might have one as a value, they might have anything in between as a value, but they won't have anything larger. This is a compact convex space in, you know, all locally compact or locally convex, whatever all the conditions of crime million are. So in particular, if we want to understand the space, um, if there's some function here, which is not fixed by G, there has to be an extremal function because everything in the convex hull of things fixed by G is fixed by G. So all we need to do now is analyze the extremal functions. Are there any questions? I like this also. All right. So let's consider this extremal F. Well then by definition, right? F is going to be equal to F of X H mu of H. And then I'm going to write this in a weird way. I'm just going to pull out the mu of g term, right? So I wrote, right? So f of x is going to be equal to f of x h mu of h. And now it's going to be equal to all of this. Um, the group is commutative. So I'm going to send the h to the left and the g to the left. Um, and I write it like this. And I have a complicated function here. I, sorry, there should be a sum here. Then we're going to call this function um, f prime, right? So we're going to say that f of x is going to be equal to f. So f is going to be equal to f prime plus g of f. Well, what can we say about this sort of complicated sum? Well, it's harmonic, right? It's the sum of a bunch of harmonic functions that already gets you what you want. It's bounded below by zero because we're summing a bunch of functions, all of which are bounded below by zero. And it's bounded above by one minus mu of g. And this just follows from the triangle inequality. We're adding up a bunch of things whose sum at each coordinate is below, right? If we just look at the max of each thing, it sums to less than one minus mu of g. So f is going to be a convex combination of f prime and g of f. But now a miracle happened. Since f is a convex combination of f prime and g of x, and f is extremal, this means that g of f is equal to f, which is exactly what we wanted. So um, I want to be clear, we, we were very much using the commutativity. In particular, it was very important to use commutativity to go from um, f of x h, or sorry, to go basically from f of x g to f of g x. Without commutativity, you don't have that. So sort of by as a slick, almost abstract nonsense argument, we get that all abelian groups and all measures, you only have bounded harmonic functions. Now I want to generalize this in the last few minutes um, I guess I should ask, how much time do I have? Do I have five minutes or do I have, or should I end now? You have five minutes. Okay. So we're going to try and generalize this to a broader class of groups. 
So um, in particular, suppose I'm going to prove the following important lemma. If I let mu be a non-degenerate measure on G and let G have a finite conjugacy class, then G acts trivially on all bounded harmonic functions. First of all, we're going to reduce to the case um, where G is in the center of G. Let H be the centralizer subgroup of G. So H is a group of all things which commute with G. Well, because G has finite conjugacy class, H is a finite index subgroup of G. So if F of X is equal to H of X, Seth, for, you know, X in H, then F minus H of F is identically zero on H. So right now I'm just going to assume that right this H thing holds an H, right? If H acts trivially just an H, then F minus H of F is identically zero on H. And since H is a finite index subgroup and therefore recurrent, this implies that F is identically zero everywhere. So it actually just suffices to look at the case where instead of having a finite conjugacy class, you're literally in the center. Um, right, and we recall that for any mu harmonic function, it's also going to be mu h harmonic, where h is a hitting measure, where mu h is a hitting measure on h. This is, again, this thing we mentioned um, from the optional stopping time theorem. So really, all we need to do is look at central elements. You can sort of use this slick little ab bit of abstractness to reduce to the case where h is um, a central element. So now let's assume H is a central element of H. And as before, we might just take a convolutional power so that H is in support. As before, let's you know, consider the space C of mu harmonic functions bounded between zero and one, allowing endpoints. As before, this is a compact convex space. So there exists a function F. So if there's a function F, which is not fixed by G, uh, or I guess, sorry, fixed by H, then there exists an extremal such function. I'm sorry, I should not, I, I wrote things wrong here. So I'm going to do the same argument I did last time. Right, again, by the triangle inequality, this first function is going to be bounded above by one minus mu of g. And by positivity, it's bounded pointwise below by zero. But it's but now it's not going to just sort of obviously be the sum of harmonic functions, but it is going to be a difference of harmonic functions. I, I'm sorry, I should have written f of hx here, right? So we've written f as h of f plus some other harmonic function bounded between zero and one minus mu of h. So again, it's a convex combination. And so we have the f of hx is equal to f of x as desired. Basically, the exact same argument works. If you understand the abelian case, you just run it through, and it's going to work in the case where you have a central element. The only um, difficulty is that, um, right, you, the thing that's immediately obviously harmonic, you now notice harmonic because it's a difference between two harmonic functions, and harmonicity is stable under linear combinations. All right, um, and I will talk more about applications of that lemma tomorrow. Okay, let's thank John. Thank you. Uh, Giva, do you want to ask your question? Or do you want? Um, sure, so intuitively, it looks like we could generalize the idea of the proof that you gave for Rn at the very beginning of the talk um, for, for this general you know, group theoretic setting, essentially by taking self-convolutions of the measure and summing